there's a name We will fix our eyes on the one who overcame We will stand in awe of the one who breaks the chain this summer in June. What motivates me to serve is just a heart full of gratitude. I am so grateful for what Jesus has done on my behalf and in and through me every single day. And so worship to me really is an opportunity to just gush that gratitude in a language that really is a heart language. Music really is the language of the soul. And it gives me an opportunity to express to Jesus my gratitude and my thanks and my overwhelming love for Him in a way that words just aren't adequate to accomplish. You know, our worship center now obviously is very different because there are no people. 
and it is a very different experience leading worship from that perspective. You know, you realize that on a normal Sunday that we have a beautiful synergy because the people sing and we get to hear that. And with that not being the case now, I realize sort of the sadness of that and I feel the, the weight of that and not being gathered with our church family, but God is still there. We feel His presence and we know He's working in powerful ways and He's moving in the hearts and lives of our body, whether they're sitting there physically or not, because we serve a big God and He doesn't need us to be sitting in the room in order to touch our hearts, obviously. Very recently, one of my dear friends sent me a video of her granddaughter and she had a big screen TV of our church service playing and her granddaughter was just dancing and twirling and singing along and doing herkies and cartwheels and just praising Jesus in her way. And that's a very unique thing that we can enjoy right now. Our church is still carrying on on Sunday mornings and to see it look as it always has is comforting, I think. But we have to continue to reach out to our community. We have to continue to worship. We have to continue to work at community. And I feel like that when we continue to lead via Facebook or whatever the link is, I just think that we help facilitate God's Word and help give people words via the lyrics that we're singing of how to connect with God and how to articulate to God how much they love Him. We've been utilizing lots of resources to reach people for Christ. And I am grateful that God is utilizing those skills that people on our media team have faithfully honed those skills and have, and it's just a, a really cool thing to see how God is utilizing those people with those gifts to make Jesus' name famous. They're the unsung heroes in our COVID crisis. And I'm so grateful for our church having poured into those people, having people like that on our staff who are well equipped and they are utilizing those gifts and they're making such a wonderful impact in our community. And I'm grateful for what they have done in the past and how those gifts have been honed and how they're utilizing them currently to reach our community and our world for Christ. Great the chasm that lay between us, and how high the mountain that I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, and what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages, He stepped down from glory to 
wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken and I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my Jesus, we are so grateful this morning that we know the truth of what we have just sung, that we've experienced it in you, and we get to live it out each and every day of our lives. God, we're scared at moments, scared of what will be, scared of what might have been lost, scared of what could be, and yet we know that you are the God over all. So in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our struggle, Jesus, we ask you to enter in, to have full sway in everything we do, think, and say, to the extent that we live out, that we really do believe what we've just sung, that you are our living hope. And God, help us remember all the other times in our lives when we've been fearful, put down, struggling. How you've always come through. And 
knowing that that is the case, help us remember that you will certainly come through again, even as you're doing now. We have so much to be thankful for, God. For you are our faithful God. So hear us say to you how much we love you and how grateful we are for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, guys. This is uh, quite an age that we live in, the ability to go from uh, commenting on Facebook and social media platforms to uh, standing here and commenting uh, with you now and sharing with you the Word of God. And I thank you so much, church family, and uh, so many friends and guests that are joining with us in our worship experiences this week. And it's not too late uh, to uh, still sh uh, share this uh, this live feed and invite others to be a part of our worship this morning. But I'm so glad that you're here joining with us this morning. It is, uh, even though you are not in this room, it is uh, somewhat encouraging to look around and to see all of these pictures in this past week, uh, to be able to walk up and down these aisles in our sanctuary in a spirit and an attitude of prayer as I looked upon your pictures here. And uh, it dawned upon me that uh, as I'm looking at these now, Nobody's going to fall asleep during the sermon here. Uh, everybody's eyes are fixed and looking forward, and so that is uh, that's certainly an encouragement. But just but just seeing these certainly is no substitute for you being here, and we will look forward to that. And until our gathering again, uh, what I have been uh, praying about in uh, the weeks ahead, however long this is, uh, I have been reading through the prophets in the Old Testament, uh, primarily uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah, and it's just, uh, it's almost haunting uh, as I've read their words and their message to the people of God as they were in exile, uh, experiencing their exile experiences. And it's a reminder, as I've shared with you on, on many occasions, that exile is much more than just a geographical displacement. Yes, what the Israelites experienced was in part a, a geographic displacement being taken from Jerusalem, Judah, uh, into Babylonian exile, Persian exile, and, but as I explained before to you all these years, that exile, we each have exile experiences. It is something that blindsides us. It is something that is disruptive uh, to the sense of normalcy that you have in your everyday life, something that disrupts the framework of your life that, that provides for each day a sense of structure and how all of that has been removed in these uh, many weeks and lives continue to be impacted, a word uh, that keeps coming Coming up, many are experiencing is uh, the word furlough. Many are uh, experiencing job loss uh, during these days. Uh, people continue to pass away. Many of our families are are in grief, uh, just uncertainty. And as I've been reading through these these two prophets, Isaiah and My, Isaiah and Jeremiah, I have just found so much similarity and uh, how timeless their message was to the people of God then and how timeless it is uh, for us today in our circumstances. And so I'm gonna try to frame over the series of these weeks, however long that might be, a, a series for us called Prophets and Pandemics. Uh, because besides this, this viral pandemic, uh, that is defining the season in life, I'm seeing other kinds of pandemics as well that uh, are no less threatening. Uh, pandemics of fear, a pandemic of uncertainty, a pandemics of anxiety that are prevalent, uh, a pandemic of discontent that is present in the lives of, of so many. And if I were a coach, I would say to you in circumstances like this, if I were a coach, uh, I would say, do not, do not forget and do not uh, forget to take advantage of this loss. As your pastor, I would say, uh, do not miss out on taking advantage of this season. That is the opportunity to learn through this season. And I think that's a fair question, even at this time, is what are you learning through this? These feelings and emotions that, that are very real, that are very troubling. Those feelings of fear, uncertainty, anxiety, discontent that, that, you, that we are all dealing with and facing. What is it, what is it exposing to you? Uh, what has it revealed to you as a person? Uh, what has it ex exposed about your faith? Uh, are you where you want to be? Uh, what you're experiencing now, whatever happens in life after this season, 
uh, is it is a faith being exposed that gives to you a sense of a foundation, a sense of stability? Or has your faith been exposed in a way that, that is troublesome to you, that you recognize that is lacking? Is there something that needs to be shored up? Does your faith need to be stretched all the more? And if that is the case, as it is, I think, for all of us, I, I think it says to us, do not miss the opportunity that is being presented to us. An opportunity to learn about ourselves, an opportunity to learn more about our faith and the quality of our Face, so don't, don't waste this opportunity. Because the reality is, is we can face this season that we're in, we can go through this, and we have this sense of, many have this sense of holding on, I just need to get through this. That if I can just, if I can just get to the other side of this, of this pandemic, if the shut-in status will just be lifted and, and we can get to the other side of this, then I can, then I can rest again and I will, I will be content. We think our contentment rests on the other side of this pandemic. But it doesn't. Do you know what's on the other side of this, of this pandemic? It's just more circumstances. Life isn't going to go back to what it was before the pandemic. As we find ourselves on the, on the other side of this, when these circumstances end, we're going to find that, that more circumstances await us. We'll probably not experience another pandemic in our life, but there, there are other experiences in life that are, going to, that are going to blindside us, that are going to take us into another exile experience where things are going to be where things are going to be disrupted, where life will not seem normal. That's just life. And those circumstances will not stop on the other side of these present circumstances. And so I think it brings us to this text this morning. That's why I so value this text this morning in, in Isaiah in chapter 26. And I want to borrow from, from Isaiah and the inspiration that God gave to him and, and his counsel to the people of, of God and, and share with you some things from, from his experience and his message to God's people then in their exile experience. I, I want to share some truths with you this morning that will, that will help you in the development of your faith and the, the, the development of our character of our faith and the strength of our faith, I want to offer some wisdom, some truths that bring about contentment in any context, regardless of circumstances. Two little verses where so much wisdom is to be found. We notice, first of all, and I'm going to, to address this text in a way that uh, I'm going to jump back and forth a bit. But, but the first thing that I think has to be foundational, this is why I'm going to start with the end of verse 4 than rather the beginning of verse 3. Because what I'm about to say is something that is foundational to understanding contentment. Overcoming a sense of discontent, but, but finding ourselves content in all things, the content that we so desire, the contentment that we so desire in any circumstances in life is something that is established by the Lord our God. Contentment is not something that is accomplished that comes about as a result of our circumstances in life. We hopefully understand that. But the contentment that we desire, that sense of rest and peace and contentment, that is something that is established by the Lord our God. Notice in verse, verse 4, it says, trust in the Lord forever. For in God the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. In the Lord, for in God the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. 
You notice the Lord is described here as uh, the metaphor that is used. He is an everlasting rock. This idea of the rock, the picture of the rock uh, is something that, that is firm, it is fixed, it is established, it is eternal, and, and it is everlasting. That's the metaphor that is, that is used to depict the nature and the character of the person of, of God. It is immovable. He is the one that establishes contentment, not our lives, not our circumstances, but but rather the Lord our God alone. Back when I was a young minister, pastor, I would oftentimes go to different conferences and things. And there was a friend of mine, we would, uh, we would uh, go to conferences together. But uh, there was this one pastor that was there that was telling a story about his little daughter as he was getting ready to leave. And apparently, every time this pastor would leave, this friend would leave and, and go off to a, a conference, his, his daughter would always ask him to bring something back. And on this occasion, when he explained she, he was leaving and going to a conference and he would see her in a couple of days, she said, Daddy, will you bring me something? And he said, Honey, what do you want me to bring you? And this little five-year-old girl, about five or six years of age at that time, she said, Daddy, will you bring me something that lasts forever? And I say that story as a wonderful illustration because because even as a five-year-old, this little girl had recognized the frailty of things. That the things her daddy would bring her from from a trip home, her earthly father, things that that he provided her, that, that he gave to her, she recognized already at this young age that those things were frail that those things would, would break, that those things were not forever. And Isaiah is saying, such is the nature of, of this world. You had fixed your hopes on all the wrong things, but it's only God, the Lord, the Lord our God, that is an everlasting rock, that, that in him alone can you find contentment. In him are things fixed and established and eternal forever. These past two months have probably been more effective in teaching us life lessons than all the sermons you've ever listened to. These past few months, I would say, have have taught in a much more vivid way the lessons of life, the lessons of faith that I have sought as a pastor, your pastor, for 18 years nearly. The life lessons we've learned are more powerful than anything I've said to you in 18 years. It certainly drives home all the things I've been saying to you these 18 years. Because the life lessons we have learned and we have seen clearly now in a very vivid way, not just preaching, but in a very real way, in ways that affect our lives very personally. And the lessons that I hope that we will never again forget is that the things of this world, things that we thought were so big, so large, so monolithic, so established that they could be trusted. I'm talking about things like like government, things like the economy, things like, like our healthcare system, as good as they may be, as monolithic as they may be, as large as, as they may seem, that, and just the scales that, of these things that we cannot even imagine, that we thought were immovable. We, in, we see, in fact, that they're frail, that they're broken, that because they originated in the minds of man, because they were built by man, regardless of how good they may have seemed, because they were created by men, they were destined at some point, they were destined to be exposed that they are weak, that they are frail, that they are vulnerable, that our lives, if we desire contentment, cannot be built and established upon these 
things. The lesson has been made very clear that contentment cannot be generated by the earthly. That all this earth offers us is a sense of discontent, wanting and searching for more. That the contentment we desire, that sense of grounding and security, it comes from the Lord our God alone. And listen to what the Apostle Paul would say in regard to circumstances. Perspective that he learned from a prison in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, Paul said, Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances. I am. My contentment is not based upon circumstances. I'm content in whatever context, he says. I, I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I've, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul recognized in the least favorable of circumstances that it is the Lord God alone, not circumstances that, that, that generates contentment in life. Second thing I, I want us to see here regarding contentment from the wisdom of Isaiah to the people of God, and that is that contentment is activated by, by faith. Yeah. The prophet would write in that first clause of verse 3, listen to this closely. He says, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace. Now, in, in the Hebrew, that, that perfect peace, translated that phrase perfect peace, it's literally peace, peace. It's a, it's a double measure of peace that, that comes when someone trusts in, in God. Now, the, the word here, steadfast, that he utilizes, the word steadfast is a word that, that, that means to lean more. Now, the fact that he says, the steadfast of mind, he's saying that, that you need to, to lean more and more. You need, to, you need to be in your mind. You need to be deliberate. You need to be intentional. It's your choice. You have to make a determination, a willful determination in your life, whatever the circumstance, whatever the context of life, it is your choice, it is your decision, what you're going to lean into. Now you have to activate your faith, it's deliberateness, intentionality, by which I choose to exercise faith and lean in to the Lord my God. Or I can choose to lean into my circumstances thinking if I just hang on, these circumstances will change only to find that there's another set of circumstances out there beyond these and it creates a sense of constant discontent, unrest, stirring, wanting, longing, searching for more. He said, but it's, but it's these who, who lean into their trust of the Lord our God that experience this double measure of peace. You got to lean in to your faith deliberately, intentionally, casting your burden upon the Lord, knowing that he will sustain thee, never, never allowing the righteous to suffer. The choice, deliberate, intentionality. The determination that each one of us have to make to stay grounded in the moment, to find contentment in, in the moment. This is the means by which we stay grounded in life instead of allowing the circumstances to cause our minds to run amok. We have to stay in the moment. It's how we stay grounded in the present tense. That's, that's why when we talk about mission, being on mission where your feet are, we, we have this sometimes a glamorized view that the idea of missions is something way out there somewhere. If I can just see it, find it, get to it. No, that's why we got to stay grounded in the moment. In any life situation, it's just, it's just being where your feet are keeps us from running ahead to tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow has in store. 
keeps our minds from going back to the past where, where we can do nothing, regardless of how successful, what our failures might have been. No, I've got to be intentional. I've got to be mindful to stay, to stay grounded here. It's the only way I can ever experience this contentment that the prophet is describing. The steadfast of mind, those who lean intentionally into the, into the Lord. You, you remember when you learned how to ride a bike? The biggest challenge was, was turning that, that bicep. You know, you might get going straight, a little wobbly, and, but then you got to turn. And, there, and, and the way you turn, it's not just turning the wheel, is it? No, you've got to learn to lean into it a little bit. And that's, that's an action of trust. You got to learn to trust, to lean into it. That's what the prophet is saying here. You got you to lean into the Lord in your circumstances. I'm sure we've all heard it when you call someone, text someone, asking how they're doing and how many times have we heard these, these past couple of months, individuals who answer our inquiries with the response, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. And the reality is all of life is lived under the circumstances. But it's choosing, it's choosing, it's being deliberate, it's being in, intentional into what I'm going to lean, what's going to be the source of my trust. And I find that as I'm steadfast, in my, as I'm deliberate in leaning into the Lord, I, I find peace and contentment, whatever the circumstances might be. You know, Jesus would offer, his, offer to his disciples in John's gospel, it's recorded in chapter 14, in verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. He says, my peace, I live with you. You go back to the beginning of chapter 14. He was talking about the context of, of death and dying and, and suffering. And you remember that he told those disciples, let not your hearts be, be troubled. You believe God, believe also in, in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Where I am, there you may be also. He's saying to his disciples, I've got to leave so that I can come back. And so between now and then, I, I, want you to be at, I want you to be at peace. You can trust in me. And listen, Jesus proved faithful in his going. He said he was going to leave. And he did. And he will be no less faithful in coming back. So between now and and then, regardless of circumstances, you be at peace. A peace that is, that is activated by faith. And finally, the prophet says to us, Isaiah says and reminds us that this contentment, it is consummated with confidence. And that's what the world needs to see in us, in a world that is so restless right now. A world that is, that is not just under a viral pandemic, but a, but a world that, that is under the pandemic of fear and restlessness, uncertainty. I hope that you and I, what we are evoking, what they are seeing in us, in our conversations, in our postings, I hope that what they are seeing us, in us is a sense of confidence confidence in, in the provision of, of God, a, a confidence that all things will work together for good. That last line in verse three, he says, the steadfast of mine you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. This is what keeps us grounded because we are trusting in him. We are contented in the moment 
contented in our whatever the circumstances because we, we trust in him. It's a confidence that is based not upon our circumstances. It's not based upon our personalities. and it's not, a, it's not based upon anything we do. My confidence is based in the nature and the character of God's person. I'm confident in God's provision. I'm confident in God's protection, not unlike the writer of Hebrews would express in Hebrews chapter 13. He says in verse five, he says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what, with what you have. For he himself has said, I will, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? So my confidence and my trust is in the nature and the character of God. My, my trust and my confidence is in my daily walk and my daily relationship with, with him. The writer of Hebrews, again, would write in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You remember that, church, our confidence is in who he is. It's not in our, in our circumstances. It's not in the, it's not in the, the systems that, that are built by men to give structure and framework to, 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 civ, to civility. Our confidence is not in, a, in an economy. It's not in a particular government. It's not in a, in a healthcare system. Those, those things have proven that they're not worthy of our, of our trust, that they were vulnerable from, from the very beginning. Our trust is not anything that is established by, by man. I would say, in fact, that that is probably one of the most compelling reasons for my belief in God. In the vast panorama, panorama of reasons why, why I would believe in God when uh, individuals would ask, well, what, what's the basis of your faith in God? Why, why do you even believe in, in God? In no small part, my, my answer, uh, among all these reasons that I would offer, that I can't prove it, it's a faith proposition. I think I have some very reasonable arguments for the existence of God and very compelling reasons. Not least of which is that my belief in God is in no small or small part due to my disbelief in man. For me, that's a very compelling reason for belief in God for the fact that man cannot be trusted that man is frail that man is weak that man is is broken and in fact I would say that the events of of the past two months the events of these past six weeks especially I I would say that instead of my faith being shaken or my faith causing me to question all the more the care and the provision of God, no, I would say that, that the events of these past weeks have confirmed all the more my belief and my faith in God. So what about you? I would hope that the same would be said about you. I hope so. Because it's only in him that we will ever find contentment. 
not in the things of men, not in the systems of men, not in the programs of men, not in the governments of men, not the economic systems of men, not the health care systems of men, but in God alone can we find contentment, rest, peace, that sense of the eternal and the everlasting. Let's pray together. Our Father, how grateful we are for the reassurance of these words. That in a world that is constantly shaken, that you are unshakable. In a world of constantly changing circumstances, you are a God that transcends all circumstances. That you are our, our solid rock, our firm foundation. And Father, I pray this morning for those that perhaps have never committed their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that Lord, perhaps in, in these circumstances have been, have been shaken all the more, prompted to ask questions all the more about what really gives certainty to life, hope to life. And Father, I pray at this vulnerable time this time of being open, this time of inquiry, that some today would choose to follow you, that some today would, would choose to establish their life upon the firm foundation, the solid rock, who is Jesus Christ, that he is one that will never forsake us, he is one that will never abandon or fail us, that he alone is the eternal rock. In his name I pray. Amen.